Good morning. Welcome in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let you and I begin our worship service with prayer. O Lord, our maker, redeemer, and comforter, we join in this service in your presence to hear your holy word. We pray that you would open our hearts by your Holy Spirit, that through the preaching of your word we may repent of our sins, believe in Jesus, and grow day by day in grace and holiness. Curb our wandering thoughts that with undivided attention we may hear your voice and sing your praise. Hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear children of our Lord and Savior, let us bow our heads and prepare for worship and the contemplation of God's word by a confession of our sins. Heavenly Father, it is with great humbleness that we approach your throne and majesty. We know that we are unworthy before you, for we know that by nature we are sinful in thought, word, and deed. We confess our numerous sins, that we have failed to do what you command, and that we have continued to do what you forbid. But we know your love for us in our Savior Jesus. You sent him to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. For his name's sake, we confess our deep sorrow for disobedience and appeal to your grace and mercy for your forgiveness. It is in and through your love that we can confess, and it is because of your tender care and compassion that we humble ourselves and seek your forgiveness, your gift of redemption, and the faith to know that in Jesus, salvation is ours. Dear friends, Please know the grace and mercy of God. Know how he has sent his son to be our redeemer, to purchase and win for us forgiveness, and with forgiveness that precious gift of eternal life and salvation. We hear the urgent plea of Jesus on the cross, words for all of us. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And because of the victory of Jesus from the grave, we also hear the words Jesus spoke to the paralytic as belonging to us, your sins have been forgiven. Go then in the peace of Jesus, knowing that by grace through faith you are counted as reconciled before the Lord our God. Peace be with you. Amen. We join together in the prayer of the day. Father of lights, every good and perfect gift comes from you. Inspire us to think those things that are true and long for those things that are good that we may always make our petitions according to your gracious will. We pray this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And hear now the word of our God as found for us in the scriptures. We're using the Evangelical Heritage Version, and please note this is Resurrection 6, also known as Easter 6. Our first lesson, our historical lesson, is found recorded for us in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17, verses 22 through 31. Here's Paul in the Areopagus, Paul talking to people about the Lord. Then Paul stood up in front of the council of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I see that you are very religious in every way. For as I was walking around and carefully observing your objects of worship, I even found an altar on which had been inscribed to an unknown God. Now, what you worship as unknown, this is what I am going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples made with hands. Neither is he served by human hands as if he needed anything since he himself gives all people life and breath and everything they have. From one man he made every nation of mankind to live over the entire face of the earth. He determined to appoint times and the boundaries where they would live. He did this so they would seek God and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, indeed, we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by human skill and planning. 
Although God overlooked the times of ignorance, he is now commanding all people everywhere to repent because he has set a day on which he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Here ends our lesson. Let's then turn our attention to our psalm lesson for today. Our psalm lesson is Psalm 66. Shout with joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Praise our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. Come and listen, all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God has surely listened and heard my voice in prayer. Here ends our psalm lesson. Our next lesson is our epistle lesson. That epistle lesson is found recorded for us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 through 22. Do note this text, or a portion of this text, will serve as the basis for our sermon. But regard the Lord, the Christ, as holy in your hearts. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that is in you. But speak with gentleness and respect while maintaining a clear conscience so that those who attack your good way of life in Christ may be put to shame because they slandered you as evildoers. Indeed, it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil because Christ also suffered once for sins in our place, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in flesh but was made alive in spirit in which he also went and made an announcement to the spirits in prison. These spirits disobeyed long ago when God's patience was waiting in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In this ark, a few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. And corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the guarantee of a good conscience before God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He went to heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. Here ends our epistle lesson. Alleluia, alleluia, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed, alleluia. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him, alleluia. Our gospel lesson for this Sixth Sunday of Easter is found recorded for us in John chapter 14, verses 15 through 21. Jesus' encouragement to hold on to him. If you love me, hold on to my commands. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. You know him because he stays with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to you. <clears throat> in a little while, the world will see me no longer, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. The one who has my commands and holds on to them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I too will love him and show myself to him. Here ends our scripture lesson. Let's you and I join together and confess our common faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's then turn our attention to our sermon for this day. Our sermon is found recorded for us in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15b. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that is in you. Thus far, God's word lets you and I continue with prayer. Well, gracious Father, how awesome and wonderful it is to hear the marvel and wonder of your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to grasp that he is the heart and core of everything we are. Help us to remember, dear Lord, it, it's not about us. It's about your son, Jesus Christ. And help us to know, dear Lord, that hope that you have given in the Christ, the Son of God. These things we ask in his name. Amen. There is a, an old evangelism program of our synod that was designed to get the evangelism prospect into thinking about eternity. That evangelism program did that by asking the question, if you were to die tonight, where would you be? And then following hard on that question was the next question, if you were to die tonight and God said, why should I let you into heaven, what would you say? So I always thought those questions were very good. I, I thought that because they were designed to make a person think. Think about the way of getting to heaven. They were also designed to give the evangelist an opportunity to make a good law and gospel presentation and to focus on the right answers to those questions. Do you know what the right answers are? That's one of the things I try to instill in my confirmands each and every year. If you would go down to our confirmation classroom, you would find a list of 10 questions there that are posted on the wall. It's my endeavor to make sure that each and every confirmand can answer those questions properly. Those three last questions, there are three last questions. Those three last questions ask this. Are you going to heaven? Why? How can you be sure? My dear people, the answer to those questions is a matter of life and death, eternal life and death. No doubt, those questions are the ones we want the right answers to. So, uh, so I wonder, did, did you note the words of our text for today? Did you see that statement that's found for us in verse 15, that statement that says this, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that is in you. So what would you say if somebody asked you the question, why should God let you into his heaven? And, and how would you answer those last three questions found in my confirmation room? Are you going to heaven? Why? How can you be sure? Do you know what the right answers are? We will contemplate the right answer as we consider our text under this theme, prepared to answer. Now, now what a great statement is found in our text. Even though it is a statement, do note that that statement calls for an answer or the fact that you are to give an answer. Once again, our verse says, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that is in you. Now please note the important aspects of this statement. The statement is calling for you to have knowledge. It does that when it simply says to you, always be prepared. Be ready. Have at your fingertips and know in your mind the thing that is going to be asked of you. It doesn't mean that you have to know everything there is to know, but rather that you know the answer to the question you are going to be asked. In this, place, in this case, it tells you what that question is. So what is that question? What is the reason for the hope that you have? Our text says it this way, that you give the reason for the hope that you have. Now, dear people, there's a statement that really gives pause for thought. First of all, it takes you and talks to you about your hope. Now, in our lives, we always have some sort of hopes and dreams. The young girl dreams of finding that illusionary white knight who will rescue her and, and make her world a happy ever after place. 
The young man might have dreams of success in business and, and all the money he could ever want. We have hopes for our children. We, we always seem to envision them perfect in every way and totally successful in whatever they want to do. Such are the dreams and the hopes that we might have in this world. Yet the hope which the Apostle Peter is addressing us with is, is much more than just a worldly thing. He's speaking to us of being sure and certain. He's speaking to us of having a, a goal, a, a hope that is more than just a pious wish, but rather a hope that is a future fact. Clearly the apostle is using this term and is asking us in this term about our faith. He's asking about our Savior and what that Savior has promised. Clearly the context tells us that we are being asked about Jesus, what Jesus really is to you. By the way, Jesus is the only hope that is sure and certain and that will always come true. You know, all the hopes I mentioned before, those hopes at best are tenuous when it comes down to this world. In truth, we don't even know if our children will survive to grow up or if that we will live long enough to see it. And in the face of this ever-changing world, we don't ever really know what will be or, or what could be. I mean, who could have ever imagined a couple of years ago this whole pandemic and, and the social distancing we're ha having to do? Earthly hopes are really just pious wishes and good vibes. The hope we're speaking to of here it is the goal of heaven and its eternal perfection. The hope that we have is about that place where there is no hunger or thirst or pain or suffering or death or tears. The hope pointed to is God's eternal kingdom. It's a place of holiness and joy and wonder and peace forever. That's what we are to have hope in. A place better than what we now have. A place that's filled with joy and peace of such magnitude that we can't even fully comprehend what God has prepared for us. This hope is ours because of our Savior. His name is Jesus. He is the reason for the hope that we have. It's Jesus who said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I will come again and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. Did not Jesus say to us, because I live, you also will live? Here are the things our Savior has promised. Here are the things we should know and be ready to share. Here is the basis for the hope we have and the confidence of our faith. But all too often, we silly and wretched creatures, creatures lost in sin and trespass, we, we forget the reason for the hope that we have. Are you going to heaven, we are asked? And we foolishly answer, well, well sure. I, I'm pretty good. I don't drink much. I only smoke occasionally. I've never abused my spouse much. Well, okay, never physically. I work hard. I, I like church, and, and when I go, I, I sing loud. You know, I, I'm on several committees. And, and I do daily devotions every once in a while. My offerings are, are generous. Well, well, I think they are. I, I, I'm doing my best, and, and I'm not as bad as my neighbor is. I mean, how could God not love me? I know a young man, when asked, on his confirmation examination day, why he was going to heaven, he answered, well, I, I live a good life. I listen to my parents. I go to church and I, I don't misuse God's name. You know, I've always thought about that young man. I, I wondered how that young man was ever going to get to heaven after the eighth grade, after that day of confirmation, because I happen to know that after the eighth grade and for the next number of years or so, you could have thrown out all the reasons that he gave for his going to heaven. The truth is, his answers were not even close. And isn't it amazing? He forgot. He forgot even on the day of his confirmation examination what faith was all about. It really is something easy to do. 
It's so easy to let the focus become us, to fool ourselves into thinking that we are okay, that we can and will earn heaven by ourselves. And by the way, that young man was me. And I give thanks to God for keeping at me, for not giving up on me as I was lost in trespass and sin, and finally for leading me to truly grasp the eternal life and salvation that's found in Jesus. Because it isn't about us. This, this hope that we have, it's about Jesus. That's why, we, uh, that, that's why we find in our epistle reading God's answer to the question. God tells us the reason for the hope that we have. He says, because Christ also suffered once for sins in our place, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in flesh, but was made alive in spirit. Now, I, I don't see anywhere in that answer anything about you or me or, or about getting it done or about what we do or what we accomplish for heaven's sake. In actuality, the only reference to us is the unrighteous. But here's God's reason. Here is where God tells us the source of our hope. Jesus Christ, our God and Lord, has made all the wonder and joy of God's eternal kingdom ours. And note what it says. Because Christ also suffered once for sins in our place. It was Jesus who paid the price for our sin. Jesus offered himself on the cross, suffered on that cross the wrath and hatred of God the Father against all sin and made atonement for our wrongs. That was the point of Jesus' words on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And later on, Jesus would cry out, it is finished. Take it all together and you realize the work of salvation was done. Sin has been paid for. God's anger is appeased. The righteous one, Jesus, did this for the unrighteous, namely for you and me. It was a complete and absolute act so complete, so absolute that there is no room for doubt when it comes to what Jesus has done. He died for our sins. He did that, as our text says, to bring you to God. That you is plural. That you refers to the whole world for everyone who is accounted before God by the law as unrighteous. That you is about us. God's son gave his life for us. And if you want, make that more personal. God's son gave his life for me. God's son gave his life for every one of you. Yes, he gave his life for, for Terry and, and Dave and, and Crystal and Vicki and Jim and Bill and Ken and every one of you listening or reading this. Jesus died to bring you to God to open the gates of heaven and give you the promise of eternal life and salvation. Jesus has done this. And there is no doubt. There is no doubt because of that last part of our verse. He was put to death in flesh, but made alive in spirit. Jesus died, and Jesus lives. His resurrection is the heart and core of our faith. Jesus lives and so will we. Jesus lives and it is clear that he was and he is the very son of God. Jesus lives and we know now that he is our redeemer. He paid the price of sin. He bought us back to be his own. The debt we owe to God has been canceled. Yes, with humble hearts, we can look to Jesus and simply say, my God and my Lord, my Savior. He lives, and because he lives, we have been promised and given eternal life. As you heard our complete reading earlier, you know that that reading in Peter mentions the, the wonder of baptism. Now, a part of baptism is that we show our confidence and faith in what Jesus has done. Jesus has given us baptism as an assurance of his promises. Baptism is not us showing God our obedience. 
It is God showing us his grace and mercy, his ability to save despite ourselves. Baptism is based on the work and promises of Jesus, and it's a very sure and certain thing. That's why this short section of baptism ends with the words, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the guarantee of a good conscience before God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He went to heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. The power of baptism is found in the power and promises of Jesus and not in what we do. And so it is in all of our faith. We are saved because of what Jesus has done. He died for us. He has brought us to God. He has been declared God and Lord of all. He has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand. He lives and rules, yes, lives and rules for our good and our eternal salvation. Now, of course, there are some that would then say, Jesus lives, therefore we must do this and this and this. And to that, I say, no. Jesus lives. Because he lives, he has given the gift of eternal life and salvation. I am his child and heir of heaven. I don't have to do anything. Jesus has done it all. And yet, it's also true that Jesus will lead me to a life that hears and follows his word, not because I have to, but because I want to. He has changed me. He has made me a, a new person filled with a hatred of sin and a desire to please God. He has given me the hope of eternal life and heaven, sure and certain, based on his redeeming sacrifice. He is the reason for this hope and nothing else. Do you know why heaven is your home? Do you know the reason for the hope that you have? The reason is Jesus and his victory. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you then to join together in prayer. O oh, merciful God, again, what a joy it is to hear this message of Jesus Christ, this wonderful gospel truth of our eternal life and salvation. And I think, dear Lord, the most important thing for us to hear is that it's not about us. It's not about what we do or what we accomplish. It's about what Jesus has done. That's the whole point of Easter and the celebration that's here. Jesus Christ rose from the dead, and in that resurrection, we have the revelation that he is your son, he is our redeemer, and that because he lives, we also will live. Thus, because of Jesus, we have the gift of eternal life and salvation. Because of Jesus, our sins are forgiven, and we are counted before you as righteous and holy. Dear Jesus, thank you for this great sacrifice. Thank you for joyfully and willingly going to the cross to die for us. And thank you that you and your Father have sent the Holy Spirit into our lives to work in us through the gospel and word and sacrament. The Holy Spirit calls us to faith. The Holy Spirit gives us that trust and confidence that we need so that we can truly know the hope that we have, that in Jesus, heaven is ours, that in Jesus, we're going there because of what he has done and accomplished. Continue to be our guide and hope. Continue to lead us through your holy word, Continue to help us grasp the importance of church and gathering together to give you worship and praise and glory and honor. Continue to help us grasp, dear Lord, that church has been given, that we might gather to be fed with your holy word and to be nurtured with this gospel truth of Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We pray, dear Lord, that you would send your Holy Spirit that all churches proclaim the pure gospel, proclaim the message of Jesus Christ as God and Lord, as our Savior from sin. We come to you, dear Lord, and also ask that you would be with all those who are sick and ailing, who are struggling in any way. We ask that you would be with them and watch over them. We ask that you would remind them that you are their God and that you will never give them more than you, they can bear, that you, dear Lord, will watch over them and, and you will make all things serve for their eternal good and salvation. We come to you humbly, humbly dear Jesus, asking you these things in 
the name of your Son, he who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive now with believing hearts the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen.